Well, you know that song, uh, Where Have All the Flowers Gone? Uh, where, where have all the billions gone, as, as it were, that these, uh, particularly the World Bank is the major um, instrument of uh, financial policy of the developed world, uh, has lent tens, hundreds of billions of dollars. Who lent what to whom exactly? Um, what did it do there? Well, it depends. You know, you can't answer that simply. I mean, in the in the state in the advanced industrial societies, it uh, helped carry out uh, a reconstruction from post-war damage. One of the factors. In the third world, it's had all kind of mixed effects. I mean, it's had effects in changing the nature of agriculture and uh, 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 developing infrastructure and gearing projects towards particular areas and away from other areas. Uh, it's been part of a long process of uh, trying to undercut import substitution and move towards uh, export-oriented uh, agriculture. It's, uh, by and large, it's been a subsidiary to, uh, uh, to the policies of those who control it, which has been largely the, I mean, the United States has an overwhelming role in it because of its wealth and power. Uh, but the United States and its immediate allies have designed programs of what they call development for the third world. Uh, money has gone in all. I mean, you, you can you'll find. I mean, money may have gone into anything from, you know, dams to uh, agro export uh, producers to uh, occasionally some peasant projects. The International Monetary Fund has been vilified in this, in the third world for the sort of sort of the, the draconian measures that it has imposed on those developing countries. Well, I mean, it's been when when I mean, take say a Latin American country today. Uh, there's a huge debt crisis. Uh, the debt crisis comes from there was when the remember that the Bretton Woods system basically broke down in the early 1970s. Uh, the Bretton Woods system involved the uh, regulation of currencies. It, re, it re, involved the convertibility of the dollar for gold, uh, and all sorts of other rules, which essentially made the United States kind of international banker. Uh, by 1970 or so, the U.S. could no longer sustain that. That was very advantageous to the United States in the 50s and the 60s. It allowed enormous overseas uh, investment by American corporations and so on. Uh, the, uh, but uh, by 1970 or so, the U.S. was unable to sustain that, and President Nixon essentially dismantled the system in 1971. Uh, that led to an enormous amount of unregulated international currency. Uh, a lot of it euro dollars, petrodollars, and so on. Huge quantities of currencies float around in international financial institutions without regulation. Uh, the, the world was kind of awash with unregulated ca uh, capital, particularly after the uh, rise in oil prices. Now, bankers wanted to lend that, and they uh, did lend it. They lent it uh, primarily to third world countries which means to elite elements uh, that, for example, Latin American dictatorships would go into a huge borrowing binge. Uh, that left the country saddled, and that was praised in the West as economic miracles and so on and so forth, like the Brazilian miracle under the general. Uh, that left the country saddled with huge indebtedness uh, when, uh, 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 in, when the 1980s came along. Uh, U.S. interest rates went up, started... Uh, uh, pulling money towards the United States, and uh, there were other, uh, the Latin American economies started going into free fall. Uh, capital flowed out of them at a rapid rate. They were unable to control their own internal wealthy classes. The capital export from Latin America uh, may not have been at the level of the debt, but it probably wasn't very far below it. Uh, there was a flow of hundreds of billions of dollars from south to north, partly debt service, which far outweighs uh, new aid by the late 80s, payment off on, pay, payment of the debt, payment of uh, interest on the debt, and so on, uh, 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 and other forms of capital flight. Uh, the net effect of this is uh, what some people jokingly call a program in which the poor in the rich countries pay the rich in the poor countries. Uh, that's uh, approximately what it, the way it comes out. Then the IMF comes along, uh, run by the wealthy countries, which have certain rules for the weak. The rules for the weak are that if you've got too high a level of incl inflation and the currency isn't stable and uh, uh, various other uh, economic indicators aren't satisfied, then 
uh, you impose extreme forms of austerity uh, and uh, balance the budget and cut back services and uh, 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 control the currency and so on and so forth. That's you know sort of neoliberal or free market economics. And that's, uh, that's, that's typically disastrous for the general mass of the population. That's why the rich countries themselves will never accept those rules unless they're forced to. So, for example, there was a time in the late 70s when Britain was, in fact, forced to adopt certain IMF rules because of its weakness. But no country rich enough, powerful enough, would ever do it. Like the U.S., for example, which has uh, incredible debt, uh, doesn't accept IMF rules. We're too powerful to follow those rules. Uh, third world countries, which are much weaker, uh, especially those which are under the control of uh, Western-oriented elites anyway, uh, who often benefit by it, uh, they do follow the rules, and there's disaster for the population. That's why you get vilification. The same thing's happening in Eastern Europe now. Um, the whole uh, neoliberal free market story is basically designed for the uh, benefit of the people who are going to win in the game. And nobody else follows those rules. And the West doesn't follow them either when it's not going to win. So, for example, the World Bank estimates that right now that uh, protectionist measures imposed by the rich countries cost the third world more than twice as much as total aid going from the north to the south. But to whom are the World Bank and the IMF accountable? To the people who put the money in there, uh, which means... Most a bunch of rich countries, primarily the United States, which is the dominant element here. I mean, the, the thing is funded by uh, by the wealthy states primarily, uh, and uh, and they the U.S. has the largest vote in them, and that's who they're beholden to. Who else? Where does the general agreement on tariffs and trade GATT fit into this economic picture? Uh, one commentator has called it the economic teeth of the new world order. I mean, GATT is, is the international trading system, which was also set up in the 40s and, you know, rumbles along uh, constantly. With, uh, with uh, uh, Right now, it's, it's in the news now because for the last several years, the Uruguay round of uh, GATT negotiations has been going on with an effort to achieve some new form of uh, freeing up international trade. Freeing up international trade in itself is... You know, as a, in a general sense, is not a bad thing. It's often a good thing. Uh, the point is, nobody goes into that game without, uh, if they have the power at least, without ample protection for their own, uh, uh, for their own internal needs. So, for example, every one of the Western powers, including the United States, uh, is entering the GATT negotiations with a certain agenda, which is a mixture of liberalization and protectionism geared to the particular strengths and weaknesses of that uh, economy. And when we speak of that economy, we mean the people in the dominant positions in it. So uh, uh, the Euro European community, for example, wants uh, fair high-level protection for agricultural production. Uh, the United States uh, has a mixture of policies. Uh, it wants... Uh, uh, it's calling for liberalization and free trade in many areas. On the other hand, it's also calling for enhanced protection uh, in areas where the U.S. is strong. So, for example, take, say, so-called services. like That means things like, say, banking. Uh, the U.S. is calling for liberalization of services in the third world, which would have the instantaneous effect of swamping uh, and overwhelming uh, all third world uh, banks and uh, financial institutions by Western ones, since they're so much richer and more powerful, that would eliminate the possibility of any uh, national development programs, industrial development programs, or others within the third world. Uh, 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 so that's kind of liberalization that the U.S. is in favor of. It means that third world economies would be basically managed by Western banks and those who run them and the governments that are tied to them and so on. Uh, on the other hand, the U.S. is calling for much higher protection in other areas, uh, particularly in such areas as what's called intellectual property rights. Uh, intellectual property rights means anything from, you know, pop music to uh, cinema to software to patents. So, for example, right now, uh, the United States is uh, racing ahead in patenting uh, what may turn
turn out to be parts of genes. Uh, the idea is to try to patent the genes of, say, corn, or for that matter, humans, uh, which means that the future biotechnology, which will involve various kinds of genetic engineering and so on, uh, will be in the hands of uh, U.S. Uh, private firms, uh, and they'll essentially control uh, control that field, and they want to make sure it's protected, so they want very high protection, you know, long patent rights and uh, uh, and so on. That means that uh, drugs, uh, software, new technology, uh, new, new agricultural forms, uh, uh, any form of uh, uh, biotechnology that may involve health and so on will be in the hands of, you know, Merck Corporation and others like them who will make tens of billions of dollars of profits, and they want to, and uh, it means, for example, that India or something, which could duplicate a lot of this much cheaper, say, duplicate Merck drugs at a fraction of the cost, will not be permitted to do it. Well, of course, that's understandable on the part of the rich. Uh, they want to control the future, naturally, and that means control technology and so on. Uh, the, the biotechnology aspect, the, the patenting of genes, has been causing an international furor in the scientific world. Uh, and it's, it can have a huge impact in the in the future. One should diminish it, uh, minimize it. Uh, so there's a mixture of protection. Uh, but we can get, for, for example, the U.S. also insists that uh, on a high level of protection for uh, for U.S. shipping. Uh, so shipping between U.S. ports has to be uh, protected in in U.S. ships. Meaning, say, if Alaska oil comes down to California, it's got to uh, be in U.S. ships. Uh, and the U.S. insists that anything involving U.S. goods uh, be done to very high percentage in U.S. ships, which benefits the U.S. maritime industry, and so on. The uh, point is, there's a mixture of protectionism and liberalization geared to the interests of those who are designing the policies, which are the powerful economic forces within the state in question. Uh, that's not great surprise, after all, but uh, that's what GATT's all about, and that's what the negotiations are about. As far as if, if the current GATT programs succeed, which it's not at all clear that they will, but if they do, they would. Uh, that, that's clear what they're tending towards. They're tending towards uh, a, a kind of a world government ruled by a club of rich men uh, who uh, meet in their organizations like the G7 meetings, the meetings of the seven richest, biggest industrial countries. Uh, which have their own institutions like the IMF and the World Bank, uh, which have a network of arrangements established in GATT, and which create a system of a kind of what's sometimes been called corporate mercantilism. Uh, remember that although this is called liberalization and free trade, there's a tremendous amount of managed trade internal to it. So huge corporations, which are often more powerful than many states, uh, carry out inter controlled, managed trade internally. Uh, it means trade across borders too, because they're internationalized. They uh, they do uh, planning uh, uh, of investment, of production, of uh, commercial interactions, and so on. They manage it uh, to their own interests for their own interests. Uh, and corporate mercantilism is fine. It's governments that are not allowed to get into the game. Uh, the, uh, the the West, the rich Western powers don't really don't have any objection at all to manage trade. They just don't want it to be done by governments. And the reason it shouldn't be done by governments is that governments have a a dangerous feature that corporations don't have. Uh, namely, governments may, to some extent, fall under the influence of popular forces, usually to a limited extent, but maybe to some extent. There's always that fear, and there's no such fear in the case of corporations, which are immune from any form of public. Uh, control or surveillance even. So therefore, they're much more uh, acceptable management agents for this uh, mercantilist system uh, being designed globally in the interest of the rich, and that plays its role in this. You mentioned the uh, powerful economic forces. Uh, increasingly, those forces uh, transcend frontiers, and there's been a massive internationalization of uh, capital and finance over the last few years. What, what are the implications of that? Well, first of all, let's remember that that's been going... I mean, first of all, there's nothing novel about it. I mean, back in the 1930s, uh, there were, uh, for example, notorious interconnections between, uh, say, I.G. Farben in Germany and DuPont. Uh, uh, in fact, big U.S. corporations.
operations were essentially producing for the German war machine right up until the war, and some even claim afterwards in various devious ways. Uh, but it did take, but, the, but the, there was a big change after the Second World War. Uh, there was a very big upsurge in uh, the creation of multi, well, you know, multinational capital. Uh, it, 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 even beyond the traditional ones, traditional ones, for example, were the energy corporations, which always were highly internationalized. Uh, but it extended much beyond the Marshall Plan, for example, was a, it gave a big shot in the arm to internationalization of capital. Uh, the Marshall Plan for, w would say, you know, designate some, you know, project in Belgium where you could maybe build a steel complex or something. Uh, and it would then encourage bids from American corporations, which would naturally win the bidding most of the time. Uh, and Marshall Plan funds were then used as intended to uh, underlie the expansion of U.S. investment uh, throughout the rich areas, that meant primarily Europe. Uh, uh, and, and that led to an explosion of international capital. I mean, foreign, U.S. foreign investment just exploded uh, in the 50s and the uh, 60s, uh, and within not long after uh, came uh, a European international capital. Britain had always been substantial. Uh, and in the recent years, Japan's joined the game, too, and done plenty of foreign investing. Uh, and there has been a great deal of internationalization, and this has increased uh, through the 80s. Uh, capital is eased much very There are a lot of reasons for this. Uh, one re uh, uh, in, in the recent period, one reason is the one I mentioned before, the uh, breakdown of the Bretton Woods system, which led to an enormous amount of unregulated, internationalized uh, wealth, capital, uh, 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 another was a revolution in telecommunications, which makes it extremely easy to uh, uh, to control international operations in which production is done in one place and the financing comes from somewhere else and you shift the dollars around and so on and so forth. Uh, that means you can have a uh, uh, executive offices in a skyscraper in New York and production facilities in you know Papua New Guinea and uh, fake banks in the Cayman Islands, which may be nothing more than a fax machine set up to evade regulation and so on. Uh, you can transfer the funds around. You can uh, you can control and manage uh, uh, importing and exporting within the corporate empire uh, through management decisions, uh, and it can be scattered all over the world, you know, with branch offices in Zurich and so on and so forth. Uh, that's had a lot of effects. Uh, just to give you one, uh, everyone knows that the U.S. share in international trade has been declining in the last 10 years. But in fact, if you look at the share in international trade of U.S.-based corporations, it has not been declining. In fact, it may even have been either stable or maybe slightly increasing. Uh, everyone knows the U.S. is supposed to have a big trade deficit. On the other hand, if you count, if you take the proportion of imports into the United States that are actually transfers from U.S. Uh, uh, U.S. corporations operating abroad to the same U.S. corporations operating internally as they say import parts for, for their own production, uh, then it probably levels out the trade deficit, maybe even give the U.S. trade surplus. Uh, uh, the point is that the functioning institutions in the world system are increasingly corporate empires. Now I say increasingly because national states retain. Uh, the rich states, at least, very substantial importance, and in fact, they are instruments of uh, integrated corporate system, corporate and banking system, uh, and also, say, increasing because it's an old phenomenon. It's uh, it goes back to the origins of capitalism. It has tr it is true that it has grown, in fact, by leaps and bounds in recent years. Well, to continue with, with GATT, uh, the Environmental News Network has, has said that GATT will, quote, open borders for businesses seeking lower labor costs and less rigorous environmental regulation, thus blackmailing U.S. workers to accept deteriorating working conditions, conditions and lower wages or lose their jobs. you think that's a fair assessment? Oh, it's, a, that's not even a, it's not even controversial. I mean, of course, it'll have that effect. It's already having that effect. So take, for example, the uh, uh, the free trade agreement with Canada. Uh, it's actually working both ways. Canada has just pressured, has just objected to uh, U.S. laws, environmental regulations,
regulations on use of asbestos, claiming that uh, that's interference with free trade. Canada's an asbestos ex exporter, producer, and they want the barriers lowered. Uh, and I think they, I, I've forgotten whether they've already won, but they certainly will win, perhaps have already won on that, uh, meaning that uh, uh, in U.S. environmental regulations on asbestos will have to decline. Sooner or later, the U.S. is probably going to uh, object to Canadian, the Canadian Health Service as an interference with free trade because it means that Canadian-based corporations are freed from the burden of paying parts of health costs that U.S. corporations have to bear because of our grotesquely incompetent and highly bureaucratized uh, health system. Uh, Canadian Canada has lost several hundred thousand jobs, there are various estimates, but none less than a quarter of a million jobs uh, to the United States, manufacturing and similar type skilled labor and so on, to the United States. Uh, the reason is that uh, they, uh, Canadian uh, corporations would much prefer to produce in, say, uh, you know, Georgia, uh, where the, the government enforces what are called right-to-work laws, which mean uh, illegal, in effect, impossible to unionize laws. Uh, state policy uh, coerces labor to ensure that there will be no unionization. As a result, the uh, work conditions are much are, are far inferior, uh, wages are less, uh, 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 and so on, and naturally uh, corporations will move to such places. In general, the effect of the free trade agreements will be to, to move to the lowest common denominator uh, with regard to wages, uh, environmental uh, protection, and so on. Now, it's not going to have that effect, you know, like mechanically, like a charm, but that's the general effect. So do you think that uh, under the rubric of free trade that the Canadian health care system would be seen as an unfair advantage that Canadians had? It hasn't yet happened, but I would expect it. I mean, I expect that American corporations sooner or later may may decide that it would be a good idea to, to undermine the Canadian health service by, uh, uh, by an argument of that sort. I think it's in the cards. I wouldn't be at all surprised if it happened. I mean, there are a lot of calculations involved in that, but... Uh, for example, one problem involved in that is that our production is so internationalized that Canadian corporations are often U.S. corporations. What did you make of the, the spectacle of the President of the United States going to Japan with um, about a score of uh, CEOs of uh, major U.S. corporations and essentially demanding and insisting on a kind of international affirmative action, as Jesse Jackson has called it? Well, uh, first of all, remember that uh, the, the propaganda phrase was uh, that Bush kept uh, screaming about is, I'm going for jobs, jobs, jobs. Uh, how much Bush cares about jobs, you can see by looking at U.S. policy towards uh, American workers. Uh, uh, so while he's talking about jobs, 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 he's also trying to, uh, the U.S. government is trying to set up the basis for Maquiladora Industries in Central America, which will take away American jobs, jobs, jobs. Uh, the phrase jobs, jobs, jobs means profits, profits, profits. That's what he was there for. Uh, and it is natural enough that it was kind of stupid for the CEOs to come along. I mean, as a, I mean, it just left the United States as kind of an object of ridicule. But whether they were along or not, they were there. That's what the trip was for, and everybody should have known that. Uh, the trip was in order to coerce Japan uh, into accepting uh, US, managed trade, uh, meaning what's called here fair trade practices, which means mercantilist arrangements between powerful states uh, to violate free trade arrangements and ensure that their own uh, powerful economic forces get benefits. Uh, again, there's nothing novel about that. The Reagan administration combined a lot of free trade bombast with a highly protectionist record. Uh, just take uh, control over imports. Uh, various kinds of control over imports, which amount amounting to duties, though there are various disguises for it, uh, protected imports into the United States do practically doubled from about 12% to 23% during the Reagan years uh, through what are sometimes called voluntary arrangements, meaning you do what we say or we close off your market to you, and so, and, and so on. Uh, the uh, 
the latest effort to get Japan to buy American auto parts is just another part of the uh, state-managed trade system that the rich always insist upon, uh, while, of course, you know, uh, beating their breasts about the free trade when you can use it as a weapon against someone else. Well, is Japan powerful enough to resist? Well, that's an interesting question. I mean, I've, you know, it's not that anyone, first of all, nobody really has answers to these questions. Uh, the, the, the domestic and international economies are only very dimly understood by anyone. So anything we say, it's, you know, anything I say will sound a lot more confident than it ought to be. Uh, my own suspicion has always been that the strength of the Japanese economy has been overestimated, uh, that it's much flimsier than, uh, than is alleged, uh, just for kind of objective reasons. I mean, Japan is, is a resource-poor country. It is highly dependent on uh, export for survival. Uh, in particular, it depends very heavily on the U.S. export market, on the U.S. market. Uh, it's trying, it's expanding into Asian markets, but uh, that doesn't compare with the U.S. market. The U.S. remains the richest country in the world, despite everything. Uh, also, it's it's dependent for, uh, unlike the United States, which has plenty of internal resources and enough military power to control other sources of raw materials. Uh, J Japan is dependent on trade for resources and raw materials as well. Uh, uh, also, the Japanese system, uh, which, you know, you look at the numbers, they look very rich, but if you look at the way people live, they don't look very rich. I mean, people are crammed into tiny little apartments. Uh, uh, they live a highly coerced and uh, submissive uh, existence. Uh, large parts of the population. Uh, if you develop any reasonable quality of life standards, Japan would not rank very high by many measures, though it ranks quite high by others, like health, for example. Uh, so it's a mixed story, and I think there are serious weaknesses in that economy. I'm not all that surprised by the current, uh, uh, you know, the current uh, recession and financial crisis in Japan, though. They have such resources of capital, they'll doubtless pull out of this one. Well, along with the, the Arab oil-producing states and, and some portions of Europe, uh, Japan seems to be the, uh, the only other area where there's excess capital formation for investment. There's a lot of excess capital, but it's, uh, it's not so clear what it's going to look like after this crisis has passed. I mean, a lot of it was based on very chancy investments and, uh, you know, a kind of a huge bubble in real estate, which was highly inflated and so on. But it's still true. They have plenty of excess capital. I mean, in, in my opinion, German-based Europe is a much more likely prospect for a world economic leader. You just uh, said the word crisis, which reminds me of uh, something that I've been hearing as long as I've been alive, and I'm certainly you have as well, the current crisis in capitalism. I mean, it seems to be an ongoing uh, story. Is this particular crisis any different? Well, uh, there has been a global stagnation for about 20 years now. The growth rates of the 50s and the 60s and the rise in productivity of the 50s and the 60s are things of the past. Uh, it kind of leveled off around the early 70s. Things like the breakdown of the Bretton Woods system were symptomatic of it. Uh, and since then, there has been a kind of stagnation. Uh, now, you know, it's not level across the across the globe. Uh, so, for example, for Africa, it's been a catastrophe. For Latin America, uh, it's been pretty much of a catastrophe. In fact, for most of the domains of the capitalist world, it has been absolutely catastrophic, including internally. So large parts of, say, American and British society have suffered severely, too. Uh, on the other hand, other sectors have done quite well. Uh, so, for example, the so-called newly industrializing countries of East Asia, the ones in the J Japanese orbit, like South Korea and Taiwan, uh, in the 80s, they didn't succumb to the international crisis of capitalism to anything like the extent that, say, Latin America did. Up until then, their growth rates had been pretty comparable, but they separated sharply in the 80s, with the East Asian ones doing much better than Latin America. Uh, there are a lot of, again, nobody really knows the reasons for this, but one reason, one factor appears to have been 
uh, that unlike Latin America, the East Asian countries uh, don't uh, make any pretense of following free market rules. So, for example, as I mentioned before, capital flight was a huge problem in Latin America. The wealthy just sent their capital elsewhere, uh, or else it was just uh, payment on debt. Uh, East Asian countries didn't do that. Uh, so South Korea has no capital flight problem because the state is powerful enough uh, not only to control labor, which is the norm, but also to control capital. Uh, and there's no capital flight. In fact, you can get the death penalty for it. Uh, and other forms of state-managed, state-corporate-managed uh, industrial and financial uh, development pr did protect them from the this global crisis of capitalism. Within the rich countries, there were various reactions. Uh, the United States and Britain probably are the ones that suffered most from it, thanks to Reaganite and Thatcherite measures. Uh, Germany pulled out reasonably successfully, as did Italy, had a boom, in fact. Uh, Japan did quite well from the point of view of the numbers, though from the point of view of the way people live, that's another question. Uh, whether you call this a crisis or not, uh, you know, it's, it's, I mean, these are, it's, it's hard to know. I mean, it's not a well enough defined term so you can answer the question. For a very large part of the American workforce, probably a considerable majority of it, uh, real wages have either stagnated or maybe even declined for about a 20 year period. The decline of major U.S. industries such as uh, auto, textiles, electronics, etc. Is, is well documented. It's not even a matter of discussion. And uh, as you probably know, the fastest area of growth in jobs in the United States are in such areas as janitors, waiters, uh, truck drivers, essentially. But actually, the highest growing white collar uh, profession is security guard. What does that tell you? Well, I mean, it means that there's a large superfluous population which has to be controlled, and there are a large number of rich people who have to be protected from them. Well, apropos of the question, is there is there any any um, emphasized uh, economic strategy or planning to create uh, real jobs with at decent wages for, for the United for U.S. Yes. Why should there be? Well, it would seem that that elites would want to protect their position if there's. Who would? The elites would want to protect their position. Well, they sure, but you know their position does not rely primarily on U.S. labor. Well, they if, do want to have a domestic workforce. But if there's major economic dislocation and unrest in this country that would surely result from that, then their position of power and strength would be threatened. That depends. Depends whether you can keep up the public control. So, for example, some uh, well, the Washington Post a couple of days ago came out with a study about somebody did who was reported in the Post about black males in uh, uh, the city of Washington. So 46% yeah. of all black males, is that it? Yes, yeah, that one. Yeah. You saw that? Yeah, 46% of all black males between 18 and, and 35 are incarcerated yeah. in, in the and district. I think of... they say at any particular moment about 70% of them are somehow within the control of the justice system, you know, on probation or one thing or another. Well, that's a way of keeping people out of trouble, keeping them in jail. Uh, if, if they're not useful for wealth production, they have to be controlled somehow. But it's not clear that that's a threat to the uh, elites in the Washington area. Or take, say, New York City. Uh, there's, uh, uh, th there's uh, you know, I mean, the city is a, an absolute disaster. Uh, but for the wealthy sectors, and you can walk around wealthy sectors of downtown Manhattan, it looks very glitzy and eerie. Well, you know, prison, constru prison construction in the United States is one of the fastest growing industries. Yeah, the, the U.S. has by far the highest per capita prison population in the world. Uh, and uh, even things like the drug epidemic are, are functional in a way. I'm not claiming that the government starts it for this purpose. But, you know, things go on because they have certain functions for uh, elite groups that set policy. Uh, one effect of the drug uh, one, one effect of uh, the so-called drug war, which has very little to do with controlling drugs, but has a lot to do with controlling people, uh, one effect of the drug war has been to uh, uh, get, uh, create a huge explosion in the prison population. So I don't know of actual numbers, but a very long, any, anybody who works with prisons will tell you that uh, a very substantial part of the prison population is people who are in there for possession, 
that is not for harming anyone, but for possessing drugs. Well, that's a technique of control. Whether it's an economical technique of control, you could argue. I mean, how much it costs to uh, control people by putting them in prison or having them, uh, you know, kind of uh, 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 on drugs and therefore not bothering you or having them shooting each other and robbing each other in inner cities, how that compares with other techniques of social control you, would be a hard question to answer. However, to go back to your original question, as, um, as if you're a... If you're, a, say, a, a wealthy professional or a corporate executive or something like that, living, say, you know, in Westchester County, uh, there are certain things you want. Uh, you want a uh, comfortable environment, uh, a golf course. Uh, you want to be able to go to the theater in downtown Manhattan. You want your executive offices to be in good shape. You want fancy restaurants around. Uh, uh, you want to be able to uh, leave your limousine somewhere without having it broken into. Uh, you want good schools for your children. Uh, there's a rain, and you want a powerful army to protect your interests. Uh, you want a skilled workforce insofar as you need them. Uh, but much of what happens in this country is of no interest to you. Uh, if most of the country goes down the tube, that's no big problem. I love your comment that ultimately is a notion that does not occur in capitalist planning. Why not? Well, any competitive system, the more, first of all, there are no capitalist systems. I mean, none of them, if there were a capitalist system, couldn't survive for a couple of weeks. In fact, about the only capitalist systems are the ones that are imposed on third world countries for the purpose of weakening them so that they'll be, uh, that they'll uh, uh, collapse and be taken over by the rich. But there are systems that are more or less capitalist. And the more capitalist they are, that is, the more competitive they are. Uh, the and, and less planned and integrated, the uh, the more that they, they will tend towards uh, short-term gains, and that's in, inherent in the system. I mean, if you have a if a system is com to the extent that a system is competitive and unplanned, uh, those participating in it will be devoting their resources, both intellectual and capital resources, to short-term gain, meaning short-term profit and short-term increase in market share. And the reasons for that are pretty straightforward. I mean, simply, let, let's imagine that there are three car companies, Ford, General Motors, and Chrysler. And let's say they're real, really competitive, no nothing, you know, no, no, no management. Uh, then suppose that General Motors decided to uh, put its resources into creating, uh, into, say, dealing with problems of global pollution. Uh, or even trying to, you know, planning to produce better cars 10 years from now that would, uh, that would be better than those of Ford and Chrysler. At the same time, its competitors, Ford and Chrysler, would be putting their resources into uh, increasing profits and market share tomorrow, you know, next month, next year. And during that period, uh, uh, General Motors would be out of luck. They wouldn't have the capital and the profits to carry out their plans. Uh, that's exactly why. Uh, countries like Japan, uh, Miti in Japan back in the 1950s, the ministry of uh, 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 that sort of directed and organized the Japanese economy together with the big corporate conglomerates. That's why they explicitly, quite explicitly and openly decided back in the 50s to abandon free market illusions uh, and to uh, carry out national planning, industrial planning aimed at Japanese development. So, for example, where in, in newly developing industries, you know, the industries of the near future, the startup costs can often be quite considerable, and profit doesn't come for some time. Well, in a competitive society, you can't. In a cap more capitalist society, that, you're out of luck. Uh, but in a uh, more managed society, you can deal with that. And there are many free market inadequacies, well-known free market inadequacies, uh, that typically... Uh, lead capitalist entrepreneurs to call upon the state to intervene for their benefit, and in places like Japan, led to a very conscious decision to uh, uh, to uh, carry out substantial uh, uh, and organized and planned uh, interference with market mechanisms so that the economy could prosper. Uh, questions of pollution are perfect examples. If one company decides to devote resources to uh, effects on the environment, they will simply be undercut by other companies which are not doing it, and therefore they will not be in a position.
position to uh, compete in the market. Uh, these are problems. These are matters which are inherent in uh, uh, capitalist systems, uh, and that's. It's. I mean, there were experiments with laissez-faire back in the in Britain, say, in the uh, 19th century, when people actually took their own rhetoric seriously, but they pretty quickly called it off. Uh, it's just too destructive. Now, to the extent that it remains, it remains destructive. So you're saying that this this class is essentially this class of managers is essentially um, impervious to literally the bridges collapsing on the homeless and camps beneath them and tunnels bursting under the city of Chicago. Not because they're bad people, but because if they stop being impervious to it, they wouldn't be managers anymore. I mean, suppose that some, you know, suppose that the CEO of uh, some big corporation decides uh, he's going to be a nice guy and he's going to devote his uh, resources of that corporation to the homeless people, uh, you know, under the bridges that are falling down or to global pollution. He's out of a job. He's out of a job. You know, I mean, that's inherent in the system. They, they, these are institutional facts. I mean, if you look at the, uh, if you want if you want to look at how, kind of, you want to watch this at its more extreme limits, uh, one should take a look at things like the World Bank plans uh, on pollution. Uh, these actually recently surfaced. One of my favorite issues of the New York Times was, I think it must have been February 7th of this year, in the business day, back in the business section, there was a report called Can Capitalism Save the Ozone? Uh, which, ozone being a metaphor for save the environment. And the question was whether capitalism could save the environment. And that was a, a story by their financial correspondent, Sylvia Nasser, on... Uh, uh, the World Bank, the World Bank had come out with a consensus report of, for the rich countries on a position to take at the Rio conference in June on the global environment, written by Lawrence Summers, who's the chief economist, a liberal economist from Harvard. Uh, and the uh, there was a long story about this, and the basic idea is that the problem of pollu the, the rich countries should take the position led by the World Bank that the that pollu the problem of pollution is that the poor countries, the third world don't follow rational policies. Now, rational means market policies. So the rich, the poor countries don't follow market policies properly. Uh, so, the, for example, many of them are resource and raw material producers, even energy producers, for example. And they sometimes uh, try to use their own resources for their own development. Well, that's irrational because that means that they're using resources for themselves, often at below market rates, when there are more efficient producers in the, in the West who could use those resources more efficiently. Uh, so that's interference with the market. Uh, also, these third world countries often introduce some measures to protect their own populations from total devastation and starvation. And that's an interference with the market, uh, because everybody can see, well, I mean, just by definition, it's an interference with rational market policies. Well, the effect of this third world irrationality is to increase production in places where it shouldn't be taking place, increase development in places where it shouldn't be going on, and that causes pollution. Uh, so if we could only convince these third world countries to behave rationally, that is to give all the resources to us uh, and to stop protecting their own populations, uh, that would reduce the pollution problem. Well, this was produced with, this document is produced with a straight face. Now, it happened that at the same time, the same day, on the same page of the New York Times business section, there was a little item, you know, like maybe 15 lines long or something, down in the corner, unre unrelated. It was about a World Bank memo, an internal memo, that had leaked. It had been published by the London Economist. London Economist, a very right-wing, uh, kind of, uh, you know, super free, kind of the British Wall Street Journal, uh, weekly, however. Uh, they uh, they had leaked a World Bank memo written by the same Lawrence Summers, and the Times had a kind of a brief and a little slightly apologetic summary of it, including an interview with Summers in which he claimed it was just intended to be sarcastic, uh, but it wasn't. Uh, the uh, World Bank memo said that, uh, added to what I had just said about third world irrationality, and uh, it said as follows, this is the internal memo, it said that any kind of production is going to involve pollution. You just can't help it. So what you have to do is do it as rationally as possible. 
uh, meaning with the minim minimal cost, naturally, one to have the least cost possible. So let's compare, say, suppose, suppose we have some, say, chemical factory, uh, which is producing carcinogenic, carcinogenic uh, you know, uh, uh, gases that are just going into the environment. Uh, if we put that factory in Los Angeles, uh, we can calculate the number of people who will die from cancer in the next 40 years. And we can even calculate the value of their lives, let's say, in terms of income or whatever. Uh, now, suppose we put that factory, say, in San Paolo uh, or in some even poorer area. Uh, well, you know, many fewer people will die of cancer because they'll die anyway of something else. And besides, their lives aren't worth as much uh, by any rational measure. Uh, so it therefore makes sense to, to move all the polluting industries to places where poor people die, not where rich people die. Uh, and that's on simple economic grounds. Well, combine that with the other, uh, the other document. What it says is the third world should stop producing and protecting its own population because that's irrational. And we should send our polluting industries to them because that is rational. Uh, well, Summers in this memo points out that you might have counter arguments to this based on human rights and, uh, you know, the right of people to certain goods and so on. Uh, but he says if we allowed those uh, arguments to enter into our calculations, then just about everything the World Bank does would be undermined, which is quite accurate. Uh, and that's supposed to be a kind of a reductio ad absurdum. Uh, obviously, we can't undermine everything the World Bank does, so we therefore can't allow such considerations to enter. We consider only economic rationality, but uh, of course, geared to the interest of the wealthy. And that's uh, what that's what you do with pollution. Try to convince the third world to stop producing and to stop protecting their own population and to accept their pollution, because it's all perfectly explicable on uh, rational economic grounds. Any graduate student in economics can prove it to you. Apropos of this, the blindness of the planners, you have a, a fantasy. It's not blindness. I think it's very ra it's very reasonable on their part. Within their framework. Yeah. You you tell of a of a fantasy that if you were a short story writer that involves the uh, Wall Street Journal and the greenhouse effect. Can you uh, recount that? Oh, I don't know. Somebody asked me once, and I, I I simply said that if I had the talent, I would, which, which I don't, I would write a short story about the Wall Street Journal. Uh, and, uh, you know, I suppose their offices are on the, you know, maybe, you, you guess it's uh, the 17th floor of some New York skyscraper. So they'd be sitting there in that office putting out an issue of the Wall Street Journal, uh, claiming once again that the greenhouse effect is just a fraud invented by, uh, you know, um, environmentalist correct yeah. environmental left fanatic. Uh, and as the issue goes to press, the water level would have risen to that point, and you know, you sort of hear them bubbling or gurgling as the uh, as they uh, as they finish up, as they put the uh, you know start the printer running, something like that. That's about what it's like. Let's talk a little bit about um, organized labor and unions in the United States. Uh, only 15 or 16 percent of the total U.S. workforce is now union, which is uh, far below, perhaps at least by half or even more than it was uh, decades ago. And this, as you know, is the era of givebacks and reduction in benefits and skipping or deferring or, in fact, eliminating of uh, raises. Does organized labor really have uh, a positive progressive role to play? It should, but it's in a very weakened state. Uh, it's, been, it's been weak for a long time, but it was just smashed during the 80s. Uh, this started with the uh, with Reagan's success in uh, uh, breaking the... Uh, um, the uh, uh, air controller strike, uh, and it's continuing till today. I mean, the UAW just lost a serious strike at Caterpillar. Well, they're not putting it that way, but that's what happened. Uh, the they they had been uh, 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 the, the, the their strategy has been so collaborative, you know, so so uh, uh, overcome by class collaboration. You know, we nice guys work together with management, uh, that when the crisis came at Caterpillar, they're totally unprepared, and they were simply wiped out. Uh, at this point, Caterpillar is uh, probably won't even live up to the terms of the latest agreement, seems to be continuing to lock them out. Uh, well, that, that's a serious, these, these are serious blows to the, uh, to the labor movement, and that means 
to American democracy, uh, but they're much to the benefit of the mm-hmm. small sectors that are enriching themselves. So does labor have a part to play? Well, it depends on whether uh, working people can get their act together and turn the, rebuild the labor movement. It's now got to be rebuilt from the bottom and turned into a, uh, uh, a powerful uh, force for both people's rights and for democracy, uh, as it once was, and has uh, a role that's declined very significantly since the 1940s. There's been a, a, a... They're not unaware of it. Doug Fraser, the former head of the UAW, pointed out back oh, almost 15 years ago that uh, uh, there has been a bitter one-sided class war led by American capitalists fighting against labor, while labor has been seduced, meaning labor bureaucrats have been seduced by uh, class collaboration slogans. They're not fighting the class war, it's one-sided. Well, that's true. And the effect of a bitter one-sided class war is very evident. Your favorite newspaper, the New York Times, in uh, talking about the uh, economic woes, says, quote, There is little mystery about what caused the economic problems. The country is suffering a hangover from the mergers, rampant speculation, overbuilding, heavy borrowing, and irresponsible government fiscal policy in the 1980s, unquote. How well did the Times and its brethren in the media during this period of uh, economic dislocation and decline actually cover the events and give the American people uh, information that they could act upon? Well, the Times isn't in the business of giving the American people information to act upon. Uh, they uh, they hailed the uh, Reagan revolution and the uh, uh, extensive growth uh, uh, which was there, you know, I mean, there were sectors of the population that profited marvelously, including the corporate sectors, of which the Times is a part. Uh, uh, the effects on the... Uh, they they might, you know, if you look over Times editorials and, you know, commentary, they couldn't fail to see that, uh, that there are uh, social costs. I mean, you can't walk around New York City and not see that there are severe social costs, so they probably saw it too. Uh, but this was considered as a glorious period, a uh, glorious period of success. Now, you know, it's, it's, there were people who were upset about it. I mean, there were. Sec- I mean, for example, you take a look at the, you know, say Mondale funding in 1984. Uh, it's from uh, a lot of it is from fiscal conservatives who were worried about the uh, uh, the long term effects to their own interests of the uh, uh, of this kind of. Mad dog Keynesianism, you know, wild, crazed spending and government uh, stimulation of the economy through borrowing uh, that was going on through the Reagan years. Plenty of people could see that that's going to be very problematic for the economy. But you can see it in just what just happened in Chicago. Uh, the uh, I've heard estimates of the costs of fixing those uh, leaks. Uh, they might have been maybe at the level of ten thousand dollars to fix uh, leaks in these underground tunnels they didn't fix them because you want to save the ten thousand dollars uh, uh, with this cutback in civic services and the net effect will be a loss of maybe you know probably over a billion dollars or more and that's a loss to uh, private capital too compared to the SNL bailout though that's just peanuts well you know yeah the SNL bailout is much bigger than that, but uh, this the Chicago is just one piece of a growing uh, a growing disaster. I mean, the spending on infrastructure has declined radically in the last ten years, and that's going to have its costs. Uh, there's what happened in Chicago is going to happen all over the place. Well, it can't help but affect uh, even the elites. I mean, the, yeah. in fact, the area that it's, was flooded it's, helping, yeah. it's hurting them in Chicago. I mean, Chicago businesses are suffering, and insurance companies are going to suffer. Well, they're not going to like that. But there's not a lot they can do about it except by accepting more, uh, more uh, long-term uh, integrated uh, uh, state corporate planning. I mean, there there are other possibilities like democracy, but nobody's going to talk about that. Yeah, right. And and maybe there'll just be more slogans like belt tightening and uh, austerity and biting the bullet, as opposed to real genuine economic policy. Well, there's genuine economic policy, but it's geared toward the short, short-term interests of the rich. Not that it's not genuine, it's very genuine, and there's plenty of state intervention for that purpose. 
I mean, when the Pentagon budget, uh, take the Pentagon budget, which that, that's massive state intervention in the economy for the benefit of the rich. I mean, that's what keeps uh, the electronics industry going, for example. Norm, I'm afraid we're running out of time. I'd like to thank you very, very much for joining me on in this interview. Glad to talk to you, as <laughs> take, always. Take care. Right. Bye. I'm David Barsamian. Thank you for listening.